today. So as you know, you have your maps on the, the Macbeth characters. And I've already looked through the Macbeth character mind map um, in previous videos. I looked at the witches. Um, I did a video on the witches over um, the course of um, Easter. And we're going to look at Lady Macbeth's role today. And again, if you are, um, if you have these mind maps, really important that you try to use them to sharpen up your knowledge of the play. And then you marry that to, you know, the good practice of looking at past questions, understanding that the question won't be simple and straightforward, won't be, you know, write an essay on Lady Macbeth's character, but understanding that knowledge of her character, she is a central character in the play, will help you answer whatever questions come up in the exam. And you have to be able to, to think on the day and to adapt on the day um, and have a strategy for writing essays. That's something that we've already done work on. So let's go over Lady Macbeth's character, okay? For me, her whole um, role in the play is as a foil for her husband, okay? And therefore, um, what happens at the beginning of the play in terms of their relationship is very significant. And of course, what happens at the end of the play in terms of their relationship is very significant. And I think that one of the lines that you learn in relation to Lady Macbeth is his reaction when he's told the queen, my lord, is dead. His reaction is, she should have died hereafter. And that line, delivered in such a nonchalant and uh, uncaring and dismissive way, is, I suppose, the reason why we can feel, I was going to say a great degree, great degree is probably wrong, a, a degree of sympathy for Lady Macbeth at the end of the play. And any degree of sympathy for Lady Macbeth is surprising considering the way she begins the play. So that's why her story, like her husband's story, is so fascinating. These are your key scenes you're looking at to revise her. You have your acting scene summaries, have a look over those key scenes. And I suppose what's really interesting is that she goes through a transformation in the play. Just as uh, powerful, her metamorphosis is just as notable as Macbeth's. Okay, so they both go through radical changes in the play, him from hero to tyrant, her from powerful and abhorrent. So what she says at the start of the play is, um, uh, um, associated with corruption and evil and moral depravity, um, and, and we are repulsed by her. But then at the end of the play, she's no longer powerful, she's weak, and there's an element of sympathy. We're not gonna say we completely feel sympathy for her, you can't do that, but you can certainly say that you were, Shakespeare surprises us with the degree, I'll use that phrase, the degree of empathy or sympathy that one can feel for Lady Macbeth at the end of the play. It's one of the great plot twists, you're not expecting that. We know that at the start, she's an enthusiastic participant and enabler of the regicide. So when he, when he comes up with the idea, she's like, yeah, let's do it. This is how we're gonna do it. She, we're gonna see all these quotes in a moment. She's the one who drugs the guards, rings the bell, you know, covers up after him. So she has, she, she's guilty. Sorry about the, the background noise. I'm in the city center. Um, and of course we know as well that when the, um, the reality of what she's done begins to eat away at her conscience, she's consumed by that guilt that eats her up, drives her mad. So it's important to, to think about what is, if Macbeth has a fatal flaw and he does, which is his vaulting ambition. What's the, what's the fundamental flaw in Lady Macbeth's character? And for me, look, everything's about opinions. For me, Lady Macbeth is overconfident. She believes that she's stronger than she is in terms, she's not naive. I hate that term with Lady Macbeth. I, I, I do believe when people say that she's naive, it has to do with her gender and it's in, shines a light onto kind of sexist attitudes. She's not naive. She knows that the killing the king is wrong. She knows the consequences of killing the king. Where she goes wrong is she believes that she's strong enough to ignore those consequences. She believes that she's strong enough to just, you know, switch off that part of her mind, switch off that part of her brain, and just, you know, continue on. And she's not. So that's her, for me, her flaw. Not a fatal flaw, she's not a tragic hero, but it's certainly her flaw. Now let's get into, you know, the key moments in the play. I'll do two of these videos. I know you don't watch them for very long, so I'll do page one and page two. So here we have, we have to talk about how she begins the play. 
and we have to talk about the nature of their relationship at the beginning of the play. And of course, that nature of that relationship is very, very close. They are intimates. When he hears the prophecy is going to be king and he believes that the prophecy is going to come true because of um, the news of the town of Cawdor, he immediately writes this letter to his wife. And as I said to you, I think it's really significant that her first words are his words. When we hear, when we see her on stage for the first time and she speaks aloud, the words she actually says are not her words. The words she says are his words. And she says, reading aloud his letter to her, this have I thought good to deliver thee, my dearest partner in greatness, that thou mightst not lose the Jews of rejoicing by being ignorant of what greatness has promised thee. Now, that's a really significant moment in the play. It's hugely dramatic. This, this guy is, has been told that he's going to be king and he's buzzing, you know, and, and he's excited. And for him, greatness equals being king. He's already great. He's, he's blown his bridegroom. He's brave Macbeth, who well deserves that name. He's, he's Valor's minion. He's already great, but that's not enough for him. What excites him is the idea of being king. And the letter proves that the witches didn't put that idea in his head. The witches just exploited the fact that the idea existed because the le this letter proves that he and his wife have already discussed this illicit ambition. And he's so close to her. He trusts her so much. Their relationship is so tight and intimate that he tells her of this prophecy, this, this terrible possibility, and you know certainly indicates that he is thinking about regicide. So it's a really, really good quote. And of course, you'll see in a few minutes that when he calls her his dearest partner of greatness, shows love. There's a key moment later in the play where Shakespeare uses that phrase partner again. Oh, sorry, um, dearest again. And it indicates the change in their nature of their relationship. So at the start of the play, she is powerful, she's ambitious, and she understands that in order to achieve their ambition, they have to be ruthless. She understands that. She shows no moral compunction. She hears this prophecy and she decides, yeah, we, we have to do this and my job is to help you do it because you're weak. Now, one of the really interesting things about Lady Macbeth's role in the play, her dramatic role in the play, is to offer us different insights into Macbeth's character. Don't forget the play is called Macbeth. It's not called Lady Macbeth, so it's about him. And so when we hear her responding to this letter in soliloquy and she says glams thou art so the witch has told him he be tain of glams and he is because his dad was that's his inherited title and cawdor and you know the witch has told him he would be cawdor and he is because duncan said no more the tain of cawdor shall deceive our bosom interest go pronounce his present death and with his former title greet macbeth so you know that prophecy came true even though we know through dramatic irony that duncan made that decision prior to the witches meeting with Macbeth. They just knew that information, so it looked like they made it happen. Um, and then she says, crucially, and shalt be what thou art promised. And I do think that those two words are so important. Shalt be. There's no hesitation there. Maybe, could be, perhaps, might be. It's shalt be, will be what thou art promised. That's really, really, really important for me. So she is, there's no doubt that we do feel some degree of sympathy for Macbeth in this play at the beginning because she, she, he does come under the influence of the witches and he does he is married to this woman who is so single-minded and driven that um, you know that he is compelled towards this fatal act. Now that doesn't stop that that doesn't mitigate what he does. It just helps us understand him. Just because she's guilty doesn't mean that he's not guilty. Just because she's enthusiastically in favour of committing the crime doesn't mean that he has to do it. Okay, so it's complex. But what's interesting is she says, you will be, you shall be what you are promised. And then she says, yet I do fear thy nature, it is too full of the milk of human kindness. And that's a brilliant moment in the play. First of all, it's a great example of imagery, but it's you know a big surprise to us as an audience. The guy she's talking about is the guy who was, you know, whose sword smoked with bloody execution. He's the guy who once seemed MacDonald and disemboweled him and beheaded him, fixed his head upon our battlements. He's the, the guy who's, you know, sword, you know, double strokes against the enemy in the fight when he took on Sweno's Viking army. You know, so we'd make another Golgotha. 
So this guy, we don't expect to, you know, somebody, that's just a chair, uh, somebody who, um, who loves him to say he's weak. But what she's saying is, Macbeth has a conscience. And that's really interesting. She's saying he, is, he has a conscience that might stop him doing what he needs to do. So two footed milk, he kind of is to catch the nearest way. Thou wants to be great, you want to be king. You're not without ambition, you have the ambition but you're without the illness should attend it. Now for me, illness as in the corruption, for me, this indicates that Lady Macbeth maybe doesn't understand her husband as much as she thinks she does. Because he does have that illness. He is that corrupt. It's not his conscience that, you know, tortures him before he commits the crime. It's not his, his moral sense of right and wrong. What it is, is his sense of self-preservation. Her husband is an intensely selfish, even as the play goes on, narcissistic man and what causes him to hesitate before the crime is not the morality of it but the chances of getting away with it and the personal consequences for himself but this is interesting this moment because it gives us a, a deeper insight into his character we know sorry we know that she is um associated with the witches and that's a very deliberate thing but shakespeare adds great amount of attention to the play and we know that that's that, that association is built in this moment. Hide thee hither, that I may pour my spirits in thine ear and chastise with the valour of my tongue all that impedes thee from the golden round. Such an important quote, every word of it. Hide thee hither, you know, it is reminiscent of the type of language the witches use. But really what it means is, high means hurry, thee means you, hither means here. Hurry up and get here. She wants to see him, she wants to to get a, get a hold of him so that he doesn't waver and change his mind about what he wants to do. And she's very confident in her influence over him. And the imagery that Shakespeare uses is deliberately um, reminds us of the witches, pouring spirits in his ear. That's an image of potions. But really what she's saying is, I have the words that you need. I know you want to do this. And my role is to help you do this. And I'm going to. So she's powerful, she's determined, and she has no apparent moral um, restrictions. She's, whatever needs to be done, she's gonna, she's gonna help him do it. And what she says here is really important. She describes the valor of her tongue. That word valor, really important. It's been used to describe Macbeth earlier in the play as a brave man, valor's minion, valiant cousin. And what she's saying is, my tongue has valor. In other words, I'm willing to say anything. I'll, I'll, whatever, whatever it takes, I, I'll, I'll put myself in any danger. I'll say anything to get done what needs to be done. So, yeah, twisted. Yeah, corrupt. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure I go as far as, so far as wicked and evil. But, yeah, certainly a, a, a malicious, you know, um, disturbing depiction of, of human um, greed and, and corruption. No doubt about it. Fantastic language, but certainly also fascinating. And then, of course, in that key scene, you have that, that wonderful, wonderful simile, or sorry, soliloquy, soliloquy, in which she makes this speech about her conscience. And she, come you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here. Now, what does that mean? Take away my feminine instincts, compassion, love, caring. And then she says, and fill me from crown to toe, top full of direst cruelty. May thick my blood. And then for me, if you've got to learn one quote, Lady Macbeth, now all these quotes are important, but this one, stop up the access and passage to remorse. That's the key metaphor to understand her. So what she's saying there is, help me be something I'm not. Help me be a person without conscience. Now that means that she has a conscience but she thinks that she's going to be strong enough to ignore it. And she knows she'll need to ignore it because her purpose, her aim, which is to help her husband become king through regicide, is fell. And fell, as you know, means evil or wicked. So she knows what she is and she knows what she's not. And she knows what she wants to be. She wants to be the queen. She wants to be the wife of the king. She knows that she is a woman with a conscience and that will stop her and him achieving their goals. So 
she wants to be without conscience or she wants to have the strength or she de is determined to have the power to ignore that. And that's what that brilliant metaphor, stop up the access and passes to remorse means. So these opening scenes were her, they are really brilliantly written and very, very memorable. Don't forget Macbeth, when he comes to speak to her and they are so excited by this prospect and, and he's so afraid of what might, what will come. She gives him confidence. When he wavers, when he hesitates, when he says, we'll proceed no further in this business, she tells him, you know, she upbraids him, she chastises him. We'll see that in the next video. She, she accuses him of being weak. But most of all, she gives him confidence that they can get away with it. To beguile the time, look like the time. It's one of the greatest quotes from all of Shakespeare. And it's matched in the same moment by look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. And that biblical allusion to the serpent, the snake, the, the devil incarnate. You know, and that juxtaposition of the flower with the serpent. Pretend to be his friend, pre pretend to be loyal, but be ready to strike. You know, beguile the time, look like the time. So if you want to fool people, pretend them, pretend that you're, 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 you're loyal and then they won't expect the act of disloyalty. So she's, she's a wonderfully, the language she uses is striking. She's boldly immoral. She's determined to use her words to help him do what he, not to make him do anything, but to help him do what she knows he wants to do. And then she gives him that sense of, look, stick with me and you'll get there. You shall put this night's great business into my dispatch means leave it to me. I will look after everything. And she does. She comes up with the plan. She drugs the guards. She takes their knives and puts them in for Macbeth to use. So she is responsible. She is guilty. She is deserving of punishment. Of that, there is no doubt. The crucial thing is, that her guilt does not absolve him of his guilt. So when we see her like this, powerful and influential, and we're writing about his character, we can talk about feeling some sympathy for him because of the, the, um, the influence of his wife. But we should not say that's her fault that he does what he does. There's only one person responsible for what Macbeth does, and that's Macbeth. We'll talk about that further in the next video.